Durrani. Uh, he is also a member of ICOB. And please, you are welcome. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, it gives me great honor to be here with all of you, and I thank the organizers for inviting us to this wonderful conference. Uh, what we will do is that I'm going to be talking on various technological advances. You have already seen and heard some of the ones that Martin has mentioned, as well as uh, Jim. And the more important thing is that I'm going to try and identify research areas for further research, which are going to be aids in not only Hilal Crescent Moon sighting, but also matters related to the moon. I feel very strongly that we need to emphasize on the research projects so that we can encourage our youngsters to get more involved in the field of astronomy. The outline is, we are going to go through a very short description of the orbits of Earth, Moon, and various definitions of the Hilal. Uh, I consider the definitions of Hilal also as a research topic, research within quotations, because it seems that we have different definitions for that. And then there are various modes of sighting the crescent moon. We have already seen quite a few of them. And then we are going to see, starting from the source, which is the light energy from the sun, to the moon, which reflects that through the atmosphere and over with optics, to our individual eye. And at the last one, I would like to touch upon the famous hadith of the splitting of the moon and what research we can do on that. Um, I have been teaching a few courses, and I know that Brother Nidal has been doing that too. So as a surprise, there's going to be a pop quiz for all of us. So don't get nervous. So are we all ready for the pop quiz? Alhamdulillah. Are you sure? Okay. And here it comes. Over here, you see various hilals being displayed on the screen. Um, can you reduce the light in the audience, please? Because that's going to help the people to see up here. Shukran. And the question is, how many crescents can you see? Okay. okay, I'm going to count, and you can raise your hands. Anyone can see one? Okay. How about two crescents? Okay. How about three? How about four? Five? Six? Six crescents? Seven? I'm counting, one after one. Okay. It seems that the majority are about four, and I see that from the panel who's quite close, he could see up to five. The reason is that even within this small group of people, there's going to be a variation in the number of crescents that people can see. To know exactly where they are, I will go to the next side, and then I will come back again. And as you can see, we have the horizon, and for the sake of just information, I have shown one down there. But those of us who have been seeing various hilals, you can tell very clearly which of these are possible and which of these are impossible. And what is the reason for that? You know for sure that if the Hilal is below the horizon, you will not be able to see it. They all look like Hilals, but which one of them are possible? This one is okay. That one is up there and it is thicker, so that is okay. That one is further off, more elongation, and it is even thicker, 
that is okay. This one is on the right, but this is thinner than this. So either this is right or that is right. But both cannot be right. How about this one here on the left side? It's impossible for a Hilal to look in that way. So if somebody says that they have seen a Hilal to the left of the sun, with the ends pointing in that direction, they have seen something, but they have not seen a Hilal. And similarly here, it's impossible not only because it's below the horizon, that means the moon had set before the sun, but also the directions of the ends. Very quickly, going over the orbits of the earth and the moon and the sun, we know that the earth is going around the sun and the moon is going around the earth. When the moon is in line between the earth and the sun, that's when we have what is called as an astronomical new moon. You will note that I emphasize astronomical new moon and not some other terms because of some confusions that arise. One thing to note about the path of the moon around the earth, that it is inclined at about 5 degrees to the path of the earth around the sun. I'm going through this very quickly because all of this has been covered in the earlier conventions and in the earlier conferences. But the main thing to remember is that when the sun, the moon and the earth are approximately in a line, they, then it's an astronomical new moon. So in terms of orbits, there's been a lot of research done uh, by the Jet Propulsion Lab in terms of modeling the motion of the various uh, dynamics of the solar bodies, what they have done is that they have used not only uh, theoretical analysis, but they have complemented it with observations to see. For example, we do not know what the mass of the sun is. Leave alone the sun. We do not know what the mass of the moon is. So there are various estimates that are made of these masses, and then based on the equations of motion, you can see how they are going to move around, and then observations are made when they cross, for example, the meridian, that means uh, a line vertically above wherever we are, looking at the time and where they cross, that can get corrections to the theoretical models that have been developed by JPL. And even now, as, uh, amateur astronomers are encouraged to give timings of occultations that means when a moon is crossing a star or any other such phenomena. So basically, there are various empirical, that means observation results of transit times and occultation times that refine the theoretical models. So some of the research areas are more efficient algorithms for the solution of these nonlinear equations, increase in computer processing speed, because those equations are really huge, with consequent memory that is required. And most important for us is to come up with efficient education models to motivate and teach mathematics, science, and technology to our youngsters. I know that we have an education committee in ICOP who have been trying to do a lot of good work. I want to talk a little bit about our definition of a hilal as compared to a crescent moon. And it can be a little confusing. Crescent moon, as I'm going to be using, is just a curved, partially lighted face of the moon. And it occurs, as I said before, when the sun, moon, and earth are approximately in a line. Uh, there's a typo there, I said not in a line. And why am I saying approximately and why did I write not there? That's because of the five degree inclination of the path of the moon around the earth as compared to the path of the earth around the sun. The Hilal itself, the generally accepted definition is that which is visible. 
and that is the basis for starting an Islamic month. Some alternate definitions of a quote-unquote hilal are that it is visible in a computer-enhanced image capture methods like Martin had presented and also what Kamaruddin had presented with the webcam. So I would use crescent moon in these later cases of an enhanced image capture of these images. The other term that is very confusing is the birth of the moon. What do we mean by that? We find that that has to be researched, so to speak, and identified so that we don't keep using terms in a scientific uh, environment that can be confusing. Because some people say that a moon has been born if they have seen it with an unaided eye. Some say that a moon has been born if they have been able to see it with a binoculars or telescope. So then the question is, was it born for those who have sighted it with a telescope or binoculars and not yet born for those who are trying to see it without an optical aid? Or was it born if it has captured in a photographic film and not in any others? Or the images are stacked like Martin has done so efficiently? And some people say that a, bo a moon has been born, a hilal has been born, when the moon is above the local horizon, but they have not seen it, because by calculations, we know that it could be uh, about the sun, or even after an astronomical new moon had occurred. So in my talk, and I humbly request all of us presenters to use an astronomical new moon and not to use the term that a moon has been born, just to make it clear for everyone. That's my humble suggestion. So let's look at some of the modes of determining a crescent moon. We have the unaided eye sighting, the aided eye sighting, image capture, using ordinary digital cameras, or the stacking of the images. As we know, that there were various crescent moon um, surveys that were done, moon watches, in 1988, 1987, and 1990. You may recall Dr. Leroy Doggett from the U.S. Naval Observatory, along with Dr. Schaefer had done that. So that formed one of the initial bases for sighting of the Hilal. We also have in here the Omera naked eye sighting. These are old ones. And the Victor binocular sighting. And we could now add the sightings of uh, Mr. Jim Stam as well as the ones that were done in Iran, quite a few of them. So in the recent advances, we see what has been presented here in this conference so far. And with the telescoping being of uh, uh, Mr. Stam and uh, the webcast broadcasting of Kamaruddin and the image stacking of Martin. And in each of these areas, there's still more research that could be done to optimize what has been done so far. And I'm sure they will agree to that too. So let's look at some of the techniques and equipments. We saw that the preparation for the Hilal sighting is very crucial. We need to make sure that that forms part of our research process. To know exactly where a crescent moon is going to be, and I recall in some of the discussions that I've had with Martin, your telescope may be pointing exactly at the center of the moon, but the moon in its very new phase is going to have just earth shine. So if you have a high magnification, you will just see a gray area and not the crescent. You'll have to move a little bit away from the center of the moon to see the crescent. And you need to know what the local sunset time, moonset time are, so that you know exactly when to be there. And then we also saw the difficulty in the focusing of the telescope and the use of filters. Especially in the use of filters, knowing the particular, particular spectral radiation of the moon from the albedo, that means um, 
the reflectance of the surface of the moon, in what frequencies it is, we can design filters so that the majority of that light is captured and everything else is removed, just like the red filter that was mentioned earlier. Some work has been done by LASA, especially in terms of finding the lunar surface albedo, that means, again, the reflectivity. Uh, more work needs to be done in terms of the spectral range of reflection coming from the moon, not only in terms of the time when it is uh, overhead at zenith, but also when it is coming closer to the horizon, it is getting more of a reddish component because the bluish wavelengths are being absorbed by the atmosphere. We need to know this so that we can see a contrast. And even the filter that we might be using probably needs to change depending upon how low the crescent is going to be on the horizon. So contrast enhancements uh, needs to be developed further. And in terms of the twilight sky, it's my opinion that we really need quite a lot of research yet to be done for quantifying what the normal atmosphere is, how the water vapor and the aerosols affect the color of the twilight sky, the amount of um, light that is absorbed, scattered, you have multiple scattering going on, as well as to see how these spatial variations, intensity, and the spectral variations, that means the wavelengths, change, not only with time, but also with location with respect to the sun. So they are not only time dependent, location dependent, but also atmosphere dependent. By atmosphere dependent, we mean the amount of aerosols, water vapor that is uh, present in the atmosphere. And in these areas, we can actually encourage quite a few graduate students to do both a master's thesis and a PhD. That's going to help us. I will talk a little bit about this particular model. Uh, you will see here that when the sun is below the horizon, you will have an area above the sun that is going to be much brighter as compared to when you move in azimuth differences further away. So you need to have a model of curves that are going to go higher up when it is above the sun, coming further down in terms of altitude when you're moving away in azimuth, and asymptotically, that means approaching, but not quite to where you will have a certain cutoff below which you will not be able to see a hilal. And then in here, I will come back to the different uh, curves and what they represent. So this is, these are the same curves without the clutter of the previous one. To be able to get a curve of this area, of this shape, we have to come up with a different model. Most of the ones, most of the work that was done on the twilight sky has been done not only by Dr. Raymond Lee, who is actually in Maryland, and we also know the positional astronomy in which we have a wonderful uh, software that you can access through internet called the Horizons that is supported by JPL. We have, of course, our own brother Muhammad Oda and his accurate times, and we have the Umar Qura calendar. In terms of meteorology, that means what is happening in the sky and the atmosphere. There's also a wonderful series of online um, courses that you could take called Comet, and I have given the um, address, internet address over there. All of these can be accommodated into more sophisticated models for predicting when a hilal can be seen. Question is, if you get a volcano, like we have now in Iceland, what happens to our models? What happens to the sighting? What do we need to do in terms of starting an Islamic month? So these are extreme cases, but we need to consider that. Our jurists have to know. So 
some of the areas that have already been done, which is going to help in the education of astronomy, are context-sensitive lunar maps. I will show one later on. One is called Lunar 100, where the whole lunar map is there, and different areas, when you click on it, it will give you details of that area. That is important, especially when you want to see... Okay, shukran. Time really runs when you're having fun. So, in terms of automatic telescopes, there's some areas that we could go through. And human optics, we have a lot of work to do on that in terms of contrast and image size. This is the one for Lunar 100. And then in the splitting of the moon, I just want to mention that we are all very familiar with the particular hadith of the splitting of the moon. And what we need to see in here is what happened that the moon was split and joined together. So what are the possibilities? That there could be a fault line at the split. Then the shape and the depth of the fault line could be different. And then there can be a possible refusing. That means not only joining, but joining in such a way that you cannot see a fault line of what had happened. So to be able to do that, we need to know what's happening inside the moon. So we need to find out what the shape of the fault line and the depth is. And that can be determined by various shocks on the moon, on the lunar surface, by various impacts, not only of the meteoroids, which we have no control of, but various blasts. Uh, the various uh, USA and Russia, when they had gone there, they actually impacted various portions of their spacecraft. So, and they've got vibration signatures that could be analyzed. These are very fascinating areas to see the interior of the moon. So in conclusion, I would like to, make, to give a suggestion to have the ICOP website at different countries as a mirror site. We need to have very effective education to spark the interest of astronomy, mathematics, and science in our younger generation. And I see a few over here, alhamdulillah. And we need funding for these research projects and funding for education of our future scientists. So I will send by, end by saying, So many beauty out there. So which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? Jazakumullah. Thank you very much for this valuable presentation.